The royalties that a franchisor makes a living on don't exist for the first 36 months almost. So you got to have a plan of how do you fund the growth and the team that you have to hire in order to support the franchisees before the money is there. And that's yeah. an important part. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Path to Freedom podcast. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Nick Sheehan. Nick is the co-founding, uh, co-founder and managing partner of the Repum Group. Um, so this is this is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while. Um, I work with quite a few brands that are partnered with the Repum Group, so I thought it would be cool to have Nick come on, share a little bit about what the Repum Group actually is, why you know, an up and coming franchise brand or even a more established brand would partner with Repum and exactly how they really kind of help to support and, and be a strategic partner for the brands that they work with. So with that, Nick, thanks for being here, man. Wes, thanks for having me. Excited to uh, share some insight today with you. Yeah. Uh, always learn something when I talk to you. So um, <laughs> definitely looking forward to, to that selfishly, but so Give us kind of a 30,000 foot view of what Repum Group is and, and what you guys do for the brands that you are partnered with. Yeah, so I think a uh, 30,000 foot overview of Repum would be, first off, we're a full franchise development firm. And, and what that really means is we specialize in working with emerging brands. And I categorize that with concepts that are either franchise today and might have 5, 10, 15, 25 locations or Maybe they're not even a franchise today and it's five corporate locations or three corporate locations and we can help them become a franchise in that case. Uh, but I think full franchise development firm is what I found most important thing with Repum is simply that those brands need a lot of support if they want to achieve the big goals that they're looking to achieve to become a national brand. And so we work with them from start to finish on helping with brand development. Number one, two is the sales process that candidates would need to go through yep. three is construction management. And then the fourth is actually operational support because those are the four pillars that make a successful franchise or one way or another. And so we created a, a company that helps on all sides of that to make sure that they have a solid foundation essentially to grow into a national brand over the next call it three to five years that they might work with us. Yeah. And that, that kind of full franchise development support those four pillars that you just explained is is unique in in the world of franchising so i want to get into that i want to unpack each of these four pillars but before we do that i think it would be good for the audience to hear a little bit of your background and <laughs> you know what you did in franchising before you know starting repum group because that that obviously plays a lot into you know why you uh, and your partner, Rob, are even in a position to advise these other brands on what they need to do to successfully become a national brand. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, well, first off, I've done nothing but franchising since I was 23 years old. I know nothing else, and I would probably be not good at anything else. I love franchising and entrepreneurship. Uh, I think I was born to be in that, that world. But um, so I started in college. Um, I just got lucky and met a mentor. I was down in Florida. I went to college at Lynn University, small school. Um, I met a, a guy that was uh, just teaching classes on the side. He had owned 12 businesses. He was in his 70s. He was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he just took a liking to a young kid that had some hustle. Um, yeah. And so started meeting with him weekly. And long story short, um, he had a business idea that came about. It was in the ink and toner recycling business. And he said, Hey, if you want to run the run with this with me, I'd love to give you an opportunity to be in business. And so I was 22 at the time. I'm like, what else am I going to do? And I did it. And uh, I became a glorified Xerox salesman. As I like to say, I just knocked on doors, door to door, <laughs> selling ink and toner yeah. uh, to businesses, but it worked and it, it grew into a business. And, you know, a year later we had done about a half a million dollars in ink and toner sales. And, uh, I had an apartment and I had toner all over my apartment and just <laughs> delivering in my car. 
but it was good, humble beginnings and knocking on doors. I'll tell you, door to door soliciting will give you the thickest skin ever. And it was oh, a great, yeah. valuable lesson for me. Um, so fast forward five years later, we franchised that business. Mm-hmm. It was called Cartridge Depot, real original name. Um, and we, 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 uh, we sold some franchises I and mean, we got to 35 locations. Uh, I did all the selling of the franchises. I even went out and trained them. And so I just learned all the facets of being a franchisor at a very young age. And it was a great springboard. I, I sold that business in 2012 and I learned that I love entrepreneurship and franchising and I really hated the ink and toner business. So I was glad to be out of it, <laughs> but, but, uh, it was a good experience and, um, I moved back to Connecticut or I'm from New York. So I moved to Connecticut and I I worked with a company that most people know in franchising called the entrepreneur source. And I was there for about 14 months as a consultant um, and just learned a lot about some emerging brands. And I met a company called St. Gregory development group through that relationship. And these guys were these, these new young guys coming out of the gate with the really the, one of the first franchise development firms. And they had repped a brand called title boxing club and they just blew it up. Um, and they were starting their own brand called cycle bar at the time. And this was 2014. And so I joined them in 2014 and, um, you know, it just, it, that whole concept just came a rocket ship with emerging brands. And so, you know, fast forward five years later, I was chief development officer at St. Gregory, St. Gregory, uh, launched cycle bar, sold it to private equity, sold St. Gregory and, uh, to a man named Anthony Geisler. Um, and Anthony created what is now called exponential fitness. And so we, we basically did all the selling for all the exponential brands and other brands uh, at St. Gregory for the first few years of exponential's existence. And then that went in house, obviously. Um, and they brought all St. Gregory in house expo. Uh, and I opted not to do that. I was actually a franchisee of cycle bar as well. I invested yeah. in that with a partner. Uh, I wound up going from one location to 15 locations, uh, in seven States and, um, part and I own that. So I was on the franchisee side too. Uh, and then in, you know, at the end of 19, um, I opted to say, all right, I'm going to start my own thing. Uh, Rob and I came together in January of 2020 and formed what the Repum group is today. Um, and so, you know, I've just, I've had a lot of experience on both sides of the fence, I'd say to end it, which is I've been a franchisee, I've been a franchisor. Um, and I've also launched between my time at St. Gregory and Repum, uh, over 30 emerging brands uh, to go to market and understand what it takes to get that to be successful. Um, and, you know, I've sold thousands of territories uh, and opened thousands of locations at this point with with what we do on construction. So that's my background in a nutshell. Yeah, well, thanks for, for walking us through that because I think it really does set the stage of like, okay, why, why would you and Rob and the team that you've built you know, be such strategic partners because you have, you've, you've sat on both sides of it, franchise or, I mean, literally, you know, built a, a brand starting as a, a pretty young guy, you know, learned, learned franchising through a very hands-on approach. You know, you've got the franchisee experience. Um, do you guys still own your cycle bars? No, I just sold them last year. So I had a almost a six year run with those and it was great. Um, I just figured at that point in time, it was going to be with Repum the way it was going. It was, yeah. it was the right time. Um, and uh, my partner, and I actually started another business called sales rev, which is actually membership assist with franchisees. So we, we're still working with exponential and all of that too. So yeah. For like boutique fitness membership based concepts yep. specifically. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, right. that makes a lot of sense. Um, but so where did the idea for Repum come about? Cause you, you know, you mentioned St. Gregory group, there's other franchise development firms or like what we in the, mm. the industry typically call FSOs franchise sales mm. organizations. Right. So the, the concept of like a firm that an emerging brand could partner with to help them sell franchises is not a new concept. Um, mm. What you guys are doing at Repum you're getting in with brands a little further upstream in a lot of cases than most of the FSOs are. And you're certainly staying involved with them much longer than beyond the signing of franchise agreements, the sell of a franchise construction, you know, real estate site selection, construction, operational support. So where did, where did you guys really sit down and say, all right, we think there's a gap in the market and we think we can fill that gap. 
Yeah, well, it was really simple for me. I mean, it, through my tenure in franchising, um, you know, one thing I'd say in a positive way is franchising has become much more sophisticated yeah. now, today, than it was yeah. when I got into it. I mean, it was definitely a little more Wild Wild West style when I got in. Yeah. And what I mean by that, you, you could, you know, you have an emerging franchise that that has a, says has a great concept or they have a great Op- opportunity and investment wise and economics and the, the space and industry they're in. But then, you know, somebody goes and sells hundreds of territories, but then all of a sudden the franchisor is like a deer stuck in the headlights. Like, how, I don't know what to do now. now? Right. I've, I've owned, yeah, I've owned three corporate stores. Like I gotta be a franchisor. What does that mean? And there's no yeah. roadmap to being a friend. You can't like look in a rule book and say, this is what you do. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really work that way. So I just saw too many examples of brands doing that. And then seeing the other side of it, which is really the ugly side. And I don't be, want to be negative on this, but it's the, the ugly side of franchising is you, you sell hundreds of territories and then only a few open or the success isn't there. Um, and a lot of it is just preparation on the front end. Like being a franchisor is not easy at all, no matter what you do and how prepared you are. But if you're prepared and understand how to support franchisees, your chance of success is far, far greater. And so we just wanted to create a company that at the end of the day, allowed brands to grow rapidly and get to their goals faster than they could without us. And second is to do it responsibly. But yeah. finally, like at the end of the day, three, four years down the road, we can all look ourselves in the mirror and said, we did what we were supposed to do to make this brand successful. And we did everything we could. Like we can't guarantee success. Nothing, nobody can, nope. but we're putting our best foot forward to make sure they're getting what they need as a franchisee to be successful. Yeah, and and I'm glad you brought up kind of the ugly side of franchising because there is an ugly side, and you know it's it's I tell people this all the time. I mean, almost every you know kind of intro or preliminary call I have with a, a candidate, you know, we talk about this, right? Franchising is no different than anything else in this world, right? There's a lot of brands out there doing it really well, and it's still not perfect, and it's still going to be challenging, and they still cannot guarantee success for every single franchisee. There's a lot of brands doing it poorly, unfortunately. And then there's a lot of brands in the middle that are trying to do it the right way, but they're just trying to figure it out still. And they have a lot of mm-hmm. learning to do. Um, and that's that's where, you know, someone like a Repum can really come in and, and help those brands. Um, so, yeah, there's this kind of ugly side. I, I, I like that you brought up to the, the way that franchising has become more sophisticated because I think – and I'm curious your thoughts on this, right? Because I think sometimes, you know, when like for me, if I'm working with a candidate and, you know, we get to the point where I'm recommending some brands that I think are a good fit for them, sometimes their perception, you know, if I say, hey, this brand is partnered with this third party to help them sell franchises, the the candidate has a little bit of a negative perception of that. I would argue that, in most cases it's better because they they the brand has partnered with someone that has an understanding of you know what needs to happen throughout the process for someone to be educated enough to make a decision and mm-hmm. and an actual structured process to do that what what are what are your thoughts or what would you say to the person that's a little bit skeptical of okay so i'm actually interacting with someone that doesn't work directly for this brand uh you know to learn about this franchise yeah i actually think that i mean i've been dealing this for 10 years right on how you handle this and i think your point is accurate it's as long as the candidate understands that look they're everyone has their expertise and the franchisor has expertise on operating their business which you're going to hear from them understand that these guys have an expertise of how to educate you. And again, to your point, get you to a point of clarity around, does this model make sense for you as an investment, as a lifestyle, as a, whatever you're looking for in business. Right. And I think that's the important part is, you know, it, it is so crucial to get to the end of that process and not have holes in the information you need to make an informed decision as a franchisee, because when people make uninformed decisions, because, not for, it's probably unintentional from the franchise or they just don't know what to share and not share. Mm-hmm. And they've signed that franchise agreement. The franchisee be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't expect that because they didn't know. Right. So I think that's the key is like, 
we're going to overshare, to be honest with you, with within the legal realms that we can, because that's the way we think you should have access to the information in order to make your informed decision. When it's also just, you know, a better understanding of like the best way to share that information. Yeah. Right. For example, like, you know, validating with other franchisees, you know, a lot of emerging brands that are not partnered with someone like Repum might just say, cool, here's a list of our franchisees. There's six of them. Have at it. Give them a call. And now all of a yep. sudden you've got these six franchisees getting bombarded by random phone calls. Chances are they're not picking up the phone <clears throat> because they don't recognize the number. They're mm -hmm. busy, right? Whereas like someone like Repum is going to educate a brand to say, all right, look, here's, here's the best way to get candidates in front of franchisees. We do a weekly group call where a different franchisee hosts the call each week. Anyone that's active in the investigation and at the right point in the process is going to get invited to attend those weekly calls, right? Like, right? To me, that's a great example of just like a better way to disseminate the information, better for the candidate, better for the franchisor. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's, and, and it's, yeah, it, it's not something that in my opinion, a, a, a candidate should be, overly concerned about um but but i appreciate your perspective on that so let's talk a little bit more about these pillars right because this is where you guys really are different than you know most of the other franchise development or franchise sales organizations out there so first of all talk to me a little bit like what does your process look like with a brand before you guys actually sign a deal with them start helping them market and sell their franchises what what happens leading up to that yeah so i mean the first thing is we have a obviously an introduction call to learn a little bit about their concept and what their goals are um their backgrounds and so on and and really just kind of feel them out like what their are their goals aligned with what we could maybe help them with and so it's usually the first call and obviously we go through a little bit about what we do to see if that's what they're looking for if all that goes well you know, we'll move into uh, the next phase. We do a deep due diligence uh, around the brand. So the most important thing we can do is select brands that fit the criteria that we know is a winning formula. Uh, and we have to be very diligent about that and specific. And if we if we don't, then we can create problems with, fr frankly, just franchise orders that are probably not prepared yeah. for that next phase yet. Or maybe they're just, you know, they're, maybe they never will be, right? Um so the things that we look for, the number one thing, forget about the brand economics, if the founders or the, the leadership team don't align with us, and I have a I have a rule if I feel like I don't think I could go on vacation with these people for two days, I will not be partners with them. This is just a rule I have. Um, yeah, I think it's a good, and, good rule. Yeah, because, you know, it, you know, if you, you start, you get in bed with somebody, in business and all of a sudden, you know, three months in, you're not aligning on anything. It just doesn't ever go well. So when you are spending uh, a lot of time with these founders, once they're working with you, you go to yeah. God only knows how many conferences a year, like you just got yeah. off a cruise ship and I'm sure <laughs> numerous of the founders that you work with were there. Like, so the, the two day vacation rule makes a lot of sense. It's, it's practical in this case for sure. Yeah. 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 So, and then the second one is, you know, white space. Like if the industry they're in is growing or, you know, it's, it's fairly new where maybe there's not a lot of franchising in that space. I love those opportunities. Uh, the second would be white space and maybe uh, an age old kind of industry that they have a different take on it and yeah. they could carve their niche in that industry. Um, so that's the other thing. And then the bottom line though, is all that comes you know, through if, if the economics don't make sense and it doesn't make much money, then the business doesn't make much sense. And franchisees are going to see right through that too. Right. And we wouldn't yeah. want that either. So we look for those things. Um, I think those are the three things that are super important for us to make a informed decision. Um, and then the last I would say is just money. They've got to have a budget to make yeah. sense of it because in an emerging franchise or most people don't understand if you are out there and you own a business, you want to franchise it. You know, the, let's say you franchise today and you sell 200 territories and you bring on, you know, multi-unit owners and set, let's say you got 100 owners, right, on 200 territories. As an example, 
uh, and you're a retail business, I mean, those Z's aren't opening for several years. And yeah. that, the royalties that a franchisor makes a living on don't exist for the first 36 months almost. So you got to have a plan of how do you fund the growth and the team that you have to hire in order to support the franchisees before the money is there. And that's yeah. an important part. That's a really, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I don't think most people realize that, especially, you know, with your example, if you've got, because some brands really kind of cater to or, or you know, the business model lends itself to multi-unit investors, right? So if you've got people out of the gate buying, you know, three, four, five territories, they're not opening or, or locations, they're not opening all of those at the same time. They're opening them over the course of several years and um, you've got to have a budget. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get the legal documentation in place that you need mm -hmm. to to legitimately be a franchise and offer franchise opportunities. Um, so yeah, and and the last thing you want is you know an emerging franchisor that's bootstrapping it. Um, and I'm I'm sure I'm sure you know you guys have a lot of these types of conversations, but you know, because you mentioned the royalty streams are really the lifeblood of any of these franchisors. It's not the initial franchise fees. And I think a lot of times mm -hmm. people that are considering buying franchises, that's what they think about. Oh, I'm paying these fees. This The franchisor is making all this money just off of me signing up for a franchise. That's not, that's yes. not how the, the economics really work for a franchisor. Some, some new franchisors do look at it that way, right? And or they find themselves in a financial situation where they're relying on franchise fees to pay some of the bills. And that's when they start, in all likelihood, making poor decisions in terms of who they award franchises to, right? Because yeah. they need that cash um, instead of someone they might pass on because there's some red flags, there's, you know, not good alignment, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> but they're like, you know, man, it'd be really nice to have those those franchise fees come in so we, we can make payroll next month. Uh, That's right. So what, how, how many brands do you guys talk to that mm -hmm. you come away saying, okay, this is a brand that I think we we could really help and we would enjoy working with, but you're not ready yet. And here's some things to go work on and let's stay in touch, but we're probably a year, year and a half or more out from being ready to yeah. really hit go on franchising. Well, just put some numbers on it. Um, we might talk to 100, 150 brands a year. And if you kind of put that into perspective, we will probably sign three to six of those brands. Yeah. Uh, which is very low amount, right? Because it's, it's super selective. But then the, the question you had around ones that are not ready, I'd say, you know, there's probably a good 30 to 50% of those brands we talk to that have a great concept, but they're just not there yet. Whether it's they don't have enough uh, opened locations or their economics are still being figured out or, you know, their systems aren't there yet or they don't have the budget yet. There's a variety of things, but a lot of them are in that boat, um, you know, that are kind of in the, I would say in the the hybrid of, you know, in the middle, I should say, of ready to go, but have a great concept, but they're not startup. They're kind of somewhere in the the start past the startup phase. That's that's what I see a lot of. What a what what is your ideal in terms of number of locations? So say say they're not franchising yet. So that was, so we're not talking franchise locations. Like, what's the ideal number of you know corporate outlets or company owned locations? For them to be ready to start franchising i'm sure it varies depending on the business but what's yep. your thought I, so i'll go minimum first and ideal like th they have to have at least two to five locations open yeah. for us to even consider looking at them ideally i'd love to have two to five corporate and like three or four franchised uh locations okay. that that's a, at least um that doesn't really work out that way um, if they have 10 or 15 corporate and no franchise, we've done a lot of those concepts. I like that because I can you know, think of usually they, where that, that worked out pretty well for you guys. Yeah. 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 Worked out quite well. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ellie was in that boat for sure. Ellie mental health. Um, but yeah, it, it shows usually like they're in different markets. They show different, yeah. you know, opportunities work in Iowa and New York city as an example of two totally polar different opposite markets. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, and I was going to ask like, 
if you have a personal preference of partnering with a brand that's already franchised and has at least a handful of franchisees, or would you rather kind of like a blank canvas where you can come in and, and without any franchisees in, in place yet, take them into franchising and grow it? I think you kind of touched on that. So let's talk a little bit about, so that's kind of the work that that happens on the front end. Branding's part of it too, right? So how often mm-hmm. are you guys recommending that the the brands you do end up partnering with do some sort of a rebrand? Is that pretty common? Not rebrand, but um, I would say enhance the branding and enhance okay. the offering. Okay. And sometimes it's not even that, it's just getting it clear messaging wise so that everyone that's talking about the brand is singing the same tune. And wow. what that means is we go through an exercise up front and we call it our OGSM exercise, a two day exercise. And what we're going through is the branding exercise uh, that's called objectives, goals, strategies, and measures. And it's really taking the brand what it is today and peeling back layer by layer of that onion and understanding what the brand DNA is and paying homage to what that will be once we get the messaging right. It may be right already today, but at least if it is right, we've uncovered that it is. If it isn't and it's not clear, this exercise will get them to a point of clarity around that. But it also helps us aside from the brand. And by the way, the messaging is always on, on both sides. What a franchisee would hear when they're talking to us, but it's also on the consumer side, whatever that franchise or is selling. Yes. It's also what's the message to the, the customer that's buying the product or service. And so if you have all that clear, it makes it a lot easier for us to our job to present it to a candidate that's interested in this concept because everyone again is clear on what that is. And so it helps us build our sales process. It helps us build the brand equity uh, around what this means for, from a brand perspective. So we, we spend a lot of time on that up upfront um, because it's super necessary to do it the right way. Well, and, and something that a lot of, cause look, most of these, most of these brands that, you know, end up turning into national franchises that you guys would partner with the founders did not necessarily set out with the intention to franchise the business and grow it into a national brand. So Correct. I'm sure a lot of them come to you and they do need a lot of polishing around the branding and the messaging and stuff, because, you know, whenever they started the business, however long ago it was, it was nothing more than an idea to start a local business to support themselves through. Right. Correct. So right. Right. it's good to hear that you guys put as much time and emphasis and, and have, you know, what sounds like some really good systems in place for the brands that you work with to get some clarity on this because it is going to help with the sales process it's going to help you attract the right type of candidates for the brand it's going to um obviously on the the sales and marketing side for the franchisees you know the correct messaging to the customers um if you're listening to this podcast then there's a good chance that you're looking to create more freedom in your own life There's also a good chance that you realize that owning your own business can be a great way to take more control of your livelihood and create more of that freedom that we're all looking for. Also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you realize that I specialize in franchise ownership. In addition to owning franchise businesses myself, I have a franchise consulting firm, Path to Freedom, where I help people navigate what is typically an overwhelming process of understanding franchising, identifying specific franchise companies that could be a fit, and then conducting the due diligence in a thorough and efficient manner with those franchise brands. My whole purpose here is to leverage my experience working for franchisors, owning franchises myself, and how we've been able to use that to create more freedom in our lives and help you determine if that could be a path that makes sense for you as well. So if any of this sounds interesting, if you've considered business ownership in the past, whether you've explored franchising specifically or not, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to learn more about you and what it is that you're working towards in your life and determine if I may be in a position to help. A great starting point is the link below in the show notes, which will take you to a short form to fill out and you'll receive a free copy of an ebook that I've put together, The Seven Steps to Freedom Through Franchise Ownership. That'll also get us connected, and I'd love to set up an introductory call 
where I can explain a little bit more about the process that I use to help people determine if franchise ownership could be a great way to start charting their own path to freedom. So click the link below in the show notes, receive the ebook, and let's get connected. I'd love to hear from you. I want to talk a little bit about the the sales process, the franchise sales process. And you know, we always call it a sales process, but talk to me a little bit about what what the repum process is, because it's really not, it's not a one-sided sales process, right? It's a yeah. mutual evaluation. So share, share with the audience a little bit more about what that should look like in, in your eyes uh, for both the candidate, but as well as the, the franchisor. Yeah. So I, so from a franchise candidate perspective, I think the most important thing is educating them on again what i said earlier which is everything that they need to know to make an informed decision by the end of the process if this feels like a good fit or not a good fit for them one way or another and the only way to get there is to give them enough information so we have a very methodical process around delivering the information needed for them to be feel comfortable with that and so there's kind of three we call them three foundation calls and it's laying out everything from the story the brand, why it exists, um, the industry they're in, so on and so forth. And then talking about the economics of the brand as well, when it comes to investment levels, what performance is currently uh, ex exists today with current Zs or corporate locations so they can see what it would look like from a P&L perspective if we can disclose that in the item 19. Uh, and then the final one is marketing and operations. So getting a firm understanding of the operation side of the business, but also how do you get customers? What is the technology behind the brand? What is the marketing plan? What's the sales plan? All that is putting together the full picture of what they would need to know to be a franchisee. And then they go into a validation phase from there, which is talk to not only the leadership team um, on a call group call, but also talk to franchisees, existing franchisees that are operating to get a day in a life of what it looks like to be a franchisee, right? And talk to several different franchisees. So they get a perspective of that. Um, and then they come out finally to meet the team. Um, so wherever the headquarters are of the brand, the, we'll send them out there and they'll do a full day and a half presentation, get to do dinner and the whole thing. And, and I like to say, it's really about breaking bread. A lot of the information they yeah. learned there is a lot of what they heard from us just yep. regurgitated from the executive team. Um, but it's more about like, do they align culturally with this company and vice versa on the franchise or side, it's being able to evaluate, are these potential candidates going to be a good fit for them? And that's really simple in my eyes. It's, are they going to be a good fit partner? And the way that you evaluate that, and I think anybody would say a good franchisee is the, what, what makes up a good franchisee is willingness to be coachable and actually just follow a system. And then the other side of it is execution. And hard work like there's no business out there that you're going to go and take hit the easy button and you're just going to come a million dollar overnight it doesn't happen nope. right you got to take the stairs up every time and you also got to know that like you got to trust the franchisor like they've been there done it so if they say go down main street and you go down wall street it's your fault because you went down wall street to a dead end right you don't want to do that so that's what i i think are the important things yeah and and so all along the way this is ultimately an approval process on the franchisor side before yeah. then the candidate can say either yes or no, I want to become a franchisee, right? Or before they can get to yes, the franchisor first has to get to know them enough. Usually this happens after, you know, they come out to meet with the franchisor discovery day, confirmation day. Um, the franchisor is going to say, okay, you're approved, right? And so like what I tell all of my candidates that I work with is like, look, you know, you, you're you going through this process, you're learning about the business, you're learning about the franchise or the people behind the brand to decide if you think they're a good business partner for you. They're looking at you exactly the same way. And you want to make sure that you keep yourself in the driver's seat so that ultimately the decision lies with you. Don't give the franchise or a reason to make the decision for you which would be them saying, you're not approved. We don't think you're a good fit for us. And yeah. I agree with you. It's not rocket science, right? Most of these franchisors are not looking for franchisees that are 
experienced in their industry or highly knowledgeable in whatever the the product or the service may be. They're looking for general skill sets. Are they going to be easy to work with? Are they going to be almost like the vacation rule, right? Is this someone that I yeah. would want to actually spend some time with? Are they going to follow the process? Are they going to be coachable? Um, there's, you know, usually general skill sets they're looking for, depending on the business. Do they have experience building and managing teams? Some of these franchises are more sales intensive than others. I mean, that, that piece can vary, but generally speaking, it's not all that difficult for a brand to really say, all right, we feel like this is someone we want to partner with or, or no, it's not. So I'm curious for you, like how much coaching do you have to do with, especially some of your really emerging brands on when they should say no to someone and, and why? Cause I, I imagine it's very tempting. You know, you got <laughs> one franchisee, you have three people come out for confirmation day. Two of them are really not the right fit. Very tempting to be like, everyone's approved. Let's roll. So it's interesting. Um, I would a fair amount of coaching, but I learned this lesson from uh, Jason Ryan, who's one of our, our third partner. And he, uh, he worked at driven brands and uh, you know, Mako Meineke and uh, the founder, Tony Martino, who's now passed. Uh, Jason was um, he became president of that. But one day when he was on the op side, still not president, uh, there was a, a discovery day and there were some candidates that came through and the candidate that uh, Jason, for some reason, didn't vibe with this guy. And, and he just was like, I, I'm not going to approve him. And Tony turned to him and said, who are you, God? Who are you to say this guy will not do well in our system? And who made you the person that doesn't give this guy an opportunity to prove himself that he can work and do well in this business? And Jason turned and said, okay. So long story short, and this is a, a, a good story because they're not all this way. That guy joined the system and he's the number one performing location in all of Mako. Um, and so I tell you that story because I always find it so hard to make that determination on who's going to be successful and who's not at that junction. You can have a gut feel, but I've learned in you know awarding thousands of franchises that there's so many people that will surprise you. And it's not, a, it's not that far off from like, if you were in a business, you hired 10 salespeople and they all have a very, a very similar background. They meet the criteria and you hire all 10. You, you know that not all 10 are going to be your number one guy or gal. There's going to be the bottom performers. And so, you know, that's how I look at it from an approval, but in franchise or I'd say, we, I think because of the way we vet our candidates by the time they get to discovery day, you know, there are very few that would be completely disapproved. And, and the reason they would be is because they really showed some colors uh, yeah. that were not not good when they were at those decision days. Yeah, no doubt. The, the process is designed to weed out the people that are not a good fit well before they get on a plane and, and come to discovery day. But no, I'm glad you brought that story up because, you know, when I worked for franchisors in development, I can remember having conversations post discovery day with CEOs, one of which is, is working, you know, with you guys now on a new brand, Alan Young and, yep. and Alan had similar thoughts in some cases where, you know, our gut was kind of saying, you know what, we don't think this person's the right fit, but look, if they want to, mm -hmm. if they want to come in and try to prove themselves, who are we to not give them that opportunity? And, and you see, you get surprises on both sides, right? I mean, I know totally. franchisees that, you know, it was a no brand. This person's going to be a rock star. They're going to crush it. And, you know, they were mediocre at best once they got in. And then, well, you know, on the other side of that too, people you weren't all that optimistic about and they're rock stars. Yeah. Well, the other side is I think there's a, a responsibility on the franchise or side, and this is just my philosophy. It's, but it's, it's, it's like, be better, be better as a franchise or that the average person who has no business experience, been in corporate America for 20 years, who really wants this, let them come in and you be better as a franchise or to give them what they need to be successful, be a better coach, be a better leader. That's what's going to get them to be successful. Because if you look at all systems out there, and I've done this over and over again, some of the most successful brands that I've seen, I analyze kind of like, who's their franchisees versus brands that maybe aren't as successful. And I look at this example 
Exactly. There was an attorney that owns, I won't name the brand, but owns five locations of a brand that's very successful. And then there was an attorney that owned uh, five of something else, right? That's not as successful. And you look at their backgrounds and what they did and how they operate. The guy that operates that successful brand, he's a mediocre operator, to be honest with you. The guy that is the unsuccessful brand, he's also mediocre, but he's struggling losing money. So whose fault is that? I believe it's the franchisors. Be a better franchisor to help that person be successful and rise them up as a result of it. Yeah. And, and you know, make steady forward progress year over year, right? Because, you know, a lot of the brands that you're partnering with early on, even with your guidance and your expertise, they're not going to be as good of a franchisor in year one as they could be in year five in year six right. and so forth. So, you know, it's not that you have to get perfect overnight and, and you'll never be perfect as a franchisor, but yeah, constantly be focusing on, you know, where do we have opportunity to get better as a franchisor to, to really support our franchisees. And I think that's kind of a good, you know, litmus test for that, right. Is like, can we take the kind of average person, no business ownership experience, plug them into our system. And as long as they're willing to put in the work and the effort and, and follow the system, their chances of being successful are very, very high. Um, so real estate is kind of the next big thing that you guys focus on. Now, this applies to some of your brands uh, more so than others, right? Some of your brands, mm -hmm. there's, there's not a real estate component. So obviously the franchisees don't need support in that area. Why, why is this such a critical part of, you know, support, especially for an emerging brand and, and franchisees joining an emerging brand? Well, I would say the construction process before they open is one of the hardest and most challenging parts of this whole process, because again, most franchisees don't have experience in, in building out anything, right? Yeah. Maybe they've built a house in their life, maybe, right? Um, but there's very few people that are like, yeah, I'm an expert in construction management, right? And if anyone's gone through it, and I have, like renovating anything is never smooth sailing, ever, right? And it, it's just a constant, like bang your head against the wall kind of scenario. And so we just felt like we needed to thread the needle for franchisors again and franchisees to say, focus on what's most important. You sign a franchise agreement. Now it's like you need to start focusing on who you're hiring, how you're going out and marketing your business before you even open, being proactive so that when you do open your doors, you have a better chance for success quicker because you were very well prepared for it versus chasing a plumber or chasing a GC that didn't show up today and worrying about the wall isn't the way we wanted it. Those things are all important. Don't get me wrong. But if th that will happen one way or another, if we do it, yeah. what won't happen is if you didn't go out there and if you're in a business that requires pre-sales and you didn't do any pre-sales and now you're open with no members or no customers, you're screwed, right? So we focus on that. And the other side is just the knowledge we have with you know, making sure leases are the right way, finding the right commercial uh, agents to help you find leases in your spot and yeah. open locations, and then just manage the construction process to get it done in a timely and cost-effective way. Timely is key, right? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people getting into franchises, they're taking out a loan of some sorts to do so, right? And, you know, they start paying that loan back at some point. And if they open their doors for business two, three, four months later than they had anticipated that can almost kill someone before they even have a chance to get started. Right. Unless they, yeah. they really had enough cash reserves on hand. Um, so yeah, doing it, doing it in a timely manner, doing it in a cost effective manner, but yeah, even just finding the right type of real estate, um, you know, you guys are at a point now, I imagine, where you've you've helped enough franchisees sign leases, do build outs, you've got some some very strategic relationships that now your your franchisees are able to plug into. Where if, had they not have that? Because a lot of times with commercial real estate, you know, stuff's not hitting the market, right? Good properties are not hitting yeah. the the open market, right? You need someone there that's you know in the mix, in the know going to know what opportunities are coming up, know exactly what 
your brands need for for their location so ton of ton of benefit on that front um for sure and and so then talk to us a little bit more about the fourth pillar um which is how would you describe it operational support yeah so if you break down our pillars then because of rep it plays on that so brandom is our our marketing and branding division we have grow em, which is that's kind of our branded franchise sales organization that would be that division does all the franchise sales side of it build them which is what we just talked about construction management and then the final pillar is called scale em. so scale em is all about operational focus and you know, that was really an important piece for us, unique opportunity to be able to say, all right, we have an opportunity to, to help franchisors create a foundation up front in order to make sure that it's done the right way and done basically so that if someone would buy the franchise today with only five units, that it feels and looks and support feels like there's a hundred locations already open. Yeah. And so we were fortunate enough to bring in, so Jason Ryan, runs that division. And he, as I said, was the president of Mako 650 unit chain. So he knows ops and how to run it and how franchisees, you know, work and, and really how to look at it from, you know, perspective of uh, a franchisor. And then Rebecca Horowitz, who's uh, an amazing individual who came from that driven brands as well. Ops focused. She's a whiz uh, with everything. Yeah, she, she's amazing. So when a brand comes on, they work usually for three to six months with the brand before we launch it to make sure that that solid foundation is there. Um, and we'll do everything from create ops manuals for them, even help them hire the first couple executives if they're going to hire people initially. Mm. You know, all those things are put in place to make sure, again, they're ready to go when when we launch them. So how long does your and I know this varies, but ideally, how long does your relationship, your partnership with a brand last? Is this the type of thing where you're working with a brand indefinitely? Or if you guys are mm -hmm. doing your job right, should a brand eventually kind of outgrow needing you? They should outgrow us eventually. It depends how quickly they grow. Um, but it's usually, I would say, on the short, uh, a couple of years, and on, on the long, maybe five to six years. Okay. And again, it depends on on the brand. Uh, the best example I can give you that it kind of just happened with is Ellie Mental Health. I mean, Ellie went on a really fast track for growth. I mean, I think we, we awarded 600 plus territories in two years, and they opened over 250. And, you know, they, they had some private money come in with private equity, help them grow infrastructure-wise. And at the end of this past year, we we um, parted ways in a in a very good way because yeah. it was time for them to grow into their own self themselves. Now and they they grew up out of the adolescent phase. I like to say they're grown ups yeah. now and they understand yeah. franchising and and that was great for them to be able to do that. Yeah, and and Ellie's another good example of where you know, and, and we don't know how ellie would have played out had they not partnered with you guys but we've seen examples in the past of other brands that you know right time right space get a ton mm -hmm. of attention a lot of excitement around it they sell a ton of units and then they can't open them yep and that's yeah, exactly that's devastating to the brand it's even more devastating to the franchisees that invested into the brand but you know ellie you said what opened 250 some units already in, in what, like a 12 month period or 18 month period. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Yep. That's, that's following through on what was promised. Um, and, and a pretty tall task when you sell that many units. So they're executing, right. And you got to think that them, them partnering with, Rep them having the support, the guidance, the relationships that you guys were able to bring to the table is a big, big part of why they were able to execute that way. So, you know, these things are super important. And, and I just think that, you know, many people out there that are considering franchise ownership, they're not aware of some of these nuances, right? If they're looking online, you know, what brands should I be looking at? A lot of the decision making stems from, you know, what's the product or the service? Does the brand look, you know, sexy or not? How good of a digital mm -hmm. marketing strategy or how much money are they putting behind pay-per-click to, you know, make their ads show up? 
not every brand is is created equally out there and not every no. brand is you know doing the same things behind the scenes to make sure that you know they're really supporting their franchisees the the way they should be and that the foundation is solid you know to keep building off of and so you know one of the things i i tell you know anyone i work with you know especially if we end up you know putting some emerging brands on the table because look in most people's eyes an emerging brand is gonna gonna seem far more risky right than yeah yeah for sure around for 15 20 years and and has a track record but very hard to find good territory in a lot of markets for the more established brands there's there's a lot of things that could be appealing about getting in early with an emerging brand so you know one of the things i always look at is you know were the founders smart enough to realize that you know they haven't done this franchise thing before so they need to go partner with someone that has and you know that's exactly what what you guys do with the brands that you partner with so in a lot of ways you're almost getting the best of both worlds, you know, all the benefits that come with an emerging brand, but a lot of experience, a lot of guidance, um, you know, a lot of support along the way. So um, last thing, I, I know we're kind of coming up on time here, but one other thing I was curious and wanted to pick your brain about, like, what do you guys look for? I know you talked a little bit already about, you know, white space, but what do you look for? And, and it may be nothing. It may just be, hey, we're just focused on, you know, partnering with great brands. But do you have any goals around kind of the the mix of brands that you work with, right? In other words, like, hey, we've yeah. got brands in this industry and in this industry, but man, we'd really like to have a brand in this industry over here. Um, how do you think about that? Yeah, so there's always the, uh, I would say the ones that we've worked on over the years industry wise that we continue to because we we know the industry well it's a strong industry and we continue to to invest in that the first one is fitness i mean i've been in fitness forever i think fitness has shifted a lot uh post covid mm -hmm. and i think it's it's on the up upward trajectory again in, in certain uh certain parts of it yeah. um in certain modalities so we'll always look at uh, opportunities that are unique in the fitness space um, health and wellness. Uh, we love health and wellness. That's a, a very much a growing trend. As we all know, there's, uh, from anything from recovery to better mind body, all those things. Um, so we look for great opportunities in that space. Um, I love beauty, been in beauty a long time, depending on again, where, where that is, but that's a, a spot that we always look to go in. And then we also invest in home service brands. So, I like unique home service concepts that have a niche that isn't, um, you know, like for example, has uh, 15 different franchisors already in that space. Yeah. Um, and we, we typically do hire uh, or focus on the higher end versions of home service, whatever the product is that they're offering. We do like the, the a little bit more, I'll say sexy type brands around that. Yeah. Um, and then we've dabbled a little bit, like a new brand we have is the milkshake factory and we've really not dabbled in food. Um, and I like to say we do food light now, which is yeah. we don't do brands typically with hoods and cooking and all that stuff. This is just, you know, mixing, preparing, blending, serving. Um, and that makes it pretty simple. So, you know, we look at those industries. Is there is there an industry you could point to to say that you're you're not in yet, but but you'd be really interested to find the right brand to partner with? Yeah. So interestingly enough, there's. Um, there's, there's a industry I've been looking at for quite a while now that's evolving. Um, two of them, I'll say. One is I love this new trend of the tattoo removal. And and then there's wow. ones that are doing temporary tattoos that are like three, four months, and then they go away. And that's becoming a huge trend that I'm seeing with like high-end boutique tattoo parlors, not the ones that you think of that you see on movies that are in like some shady town area that no one wants to go to, right? Yeah. Um, that's one. And then that's two, cool. the evolution of this, uh, ear piercing. So there's these new concepts that are popping up all over the place that are not the typical old school, like your, you know, nine-year-old daughter goes to a Claire's and gets her ear pierced. This is by a registered nurse and more of a high end area. And it is just done in a better manner and it's becoming a big trend. So those are a couple of things I'm looking at. And so the point though, is I'll make is 
those are just new trends, right? They're age old businesses, but they're evolving in the way that they're yeah. offered. And I, I love those opportunities. Yeah. They're being modernized They're And I, and I, I always like, you see this in home services all the time, right? Where, you know, some of the really, really cutting edge brands, all they're doing is bringing their services to consumers in a manner that's more similar to how consumers are accustomed to buying things in other parts of their life, right? Technology is always a big part of that, right? Can you book an appointment via an app without having to pick up the phone and call? You know, um, that that I think is is important for people to hear, right? It's what a guy like you's looking for in brands that, you know, you may enter into a long-term relationship with these are the types of things that you know someone considering franchise ownership should be thinking about and and you know looking at as well so um good stuff man i uh i really appreciate you coming on here and, and sharing you know what repum's all about how you guys kind of think about it um last question for you where where do you see this thing going five ten years from now i mean do you do you feel like these these four pillars are kind of your, your core business indefinitely. Do you feel like there's opportunity to, you know, maybe expand into other areas of support for, for franchisors? I mean, obviously you'll continue to, to partner with great brands and help them grow, but beyond that, where, where do you see Repum going? Yeah. So I do think the foundation of our four pillars is the engine that will always be Repum. Um, but I think we can continue continue to upgrade it. You know, maybe right now we're a, a Lexus. Maybe we'll become something greater than that downstream, or maybe bigger. Right where it's a sedan today, and now we're going to be a big truck. And uh, I think that's kind of how I see this: is it continues to evolve with the engine that has existed and is really the power that makes Repum what it is. But as the franchising industry evolves. And we evolve, we, we are always looking to be innovative. And I think that's the most important thing. We are super innovative and we'll continue to be that way. Uh, Cause I think that's the most important thing for businesses to keep thriving and not, you know, getting stale and frankly uh, losing momentum over years. Yeah, totally agree. And the other thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, you and, and Rob and uh, the partners at Rep, you guys have built a phenomenal team. I mean, you know, in this, in this line of work, the people that you're dealing with are so important, right? The, whether that's, you know, at the franchise or, you know, if you're buying a franchise, those are your business partners, but also the people that you're interacting with that are guiding you through, you know, this process of making a very important decision. Uh, it's so important that you're working with, you know, people that are, are honest and, you know, doing it for the right reasons, uh, but also intelligent and and just easy to 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 work with. You guys have built such a good team. I mean, everyone on your team is not only very well qualified for the role that they're in, but just genuinely good people, fun people to interact with. Uh, you know, in my eyes, beyond you know, kind of the additional services you provide to your franchise or partners, it's the people that really make you guys stand out uh, above and beyond some of what could be viewed as your, your competitors, I guess you would say. Yeah. Well, I'll leave you with this. This is the rules I live by. And, you know, I, I view myself as, you know, leading the charge on that. Um, but I don't look at myself as someone who, you know, they work for me. I work for them as a leader of a company. If you don't recognize like as a CEO, whatever your title is, doesn't matter. Is if you don't recognize that you work for your employees, you got a problem, right? It's servant yeah. leadership because that's how you're going to get the success. And the three rules that I always tell my employees is this one, check your ego at the door. I don't care what you're trying to get at. Ego never gets you to the right decision. It always gets you to usually a bad decision because your ego got in your way and it was a blind spot to making the right decision in business. Yeah. Second is don't bring emotion into the business decision you're about to make. If you get emotional and angry about something, typically, again, bad decisions are made. Yes. And the final, and hopefully you're okay with me saying this, is just don't be an asshole. I have that rule. Just be a good person at the end of the day. You can bleep that out if you need to. But oh, like no. the end of the day, that's it's an important rule. Right? Just asshole be a here. good person. Yeah, all right, good. Asshole's good. fine. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I, I think it's it's simple, but such good advice. Um, and, you know, clearly you, you uh, practice what you preach in that regard your team does as well. So 
Um, love working with you guys. Appreciate everything that you're doing, uh, you know, to, to help these amazing brands uh, do it the right way. Right. Because there is an ugly side to franchising. And um, yes. but, you know, man, it's a it's a beautiful way to do business when it's done right. Um, and, and that's what you guys are focusing on. So um, where could people go if they want to connect with you, learn more about you, learn more about the brands that that Repum is partnered with? Um, where should we point people? Yeah, you can go to uh, repumgroup.com. And then if you want to connect with me ever, you can always email me. Mine's nsheehan at repumgroup.com. And then obviously you can find us on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, all the social handles as well. Cool. We'll put all that in the show notes to make it easy for people to find. Nick Sheehan, ladies and gentlemen, Repum Group. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.